Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us, those that are here. Um, we are getting ready to open up our meeting. It is 7.07, .07, Thursday, February 2nd, for our full board meeting. We're going to get started with our public gallery session. Uh, do we have anyone here in person that would like three minutes for the public gallery session? Jenny Make sure you put on the microphone. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I don't need two minutes. Uh, um, I just wanted to introduce myself because I just moved to the Bronx to work as the priest in charge of the church, the Episcopal Church of Good Shepherd, which is in 4401 Matilda Avenue in the corner of Matilda and Reed. So, and I just started in January, so I'm kind of new in the neighborhood, so I'm trying to meet um, the community, go to the meetings and try to know what's happening in the neighborhood. So that's why I'm here tonight, just to introduce myself, and I'm very happy to be in the midst of you. Margaret Dimanchi. Thank you. Just make sure we have your contact information. Wonderful. Thank you. OK. Virginia Sanders. Give us one second. We're going to start with our in-person presenters. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, sorry I'm late. Um, I'm here to speak on um, behalf of the community. Uh, I live in the Valley. Um, it's the area that's actually across from Co-op City. And um, they're trying to make an attempt to build a shelter location uh, on the 3200 block of Grace Avenue. And I'm just here to say that, you know, the community is concerned um, at the request of whomever to build this shelter location. Um, we feel it's gonna be a safety issue, there'll be loitering, um, and a whole host of other things that will go on. And me personally, I don't really care to have that shelter built at the location. And I know there are a lot of other individuals who are against it. Just like in other communities where they don't want the shelter locations, I feel like they should grant us the the wish to not have it built in our community as well. And that's basically uh, what I had to say. Um, excuse me, can you say your name, please? Oh, Charmaine. Okay, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Is this on? Uh, hi. Um, sorry, sorry. I'm a rookie. Um, so the um, Charmaine, what Charmaine is uh, referencing is 3240 Grace Avenue. Um, our board members, no, um, our board, some of our board members will remember that we had this issue back in 2019. Um, there was an attempt by the Black Vets for Social Justice to open up a shelter um, at 3240. Um, this was during the de Blasio administration. We were fortunate enough that we worked with our elected officials and we were able to um, get that shelter relocated. Unfortunately, it stayed in Community Board 12 and went to Furman Avenue. So that is the shelter that is um, operated by Black Vets for Social Justice at Furman Avenue. Um, we were told back then that they would not um, consider this uh, again. But Unfortunately, we as a community board have found ourselves having these, I guess, repetitive conversations about shelters, um, 3240, one of them, 4747, um, Bronx Boulevard being the other. Uh, once again, our elected officials intervened. Um, Jeff, uh, Assemblymember Dinowitz is here. Um, he can speak to it if he wants. They got assured. Not only did they were they able to get it the temporary site closed, they got assurances from DHS that they would no longer consider this site, and then DHS went back on their word um, and opened up the site as a um, migrant shelter. And you know, I I don't know what to say because the landlord and one of the th I will say this. 
we have, re as a community board, we've reached out, I've reached out numerous times to DHS. Um, there is a filing on the building's website for this property. It is being built as a uh, uh, shelter or what they call a not-for-profit with sleeping accommodations. That's what it says on the certificate of occupancy. This is a, uh, they're making major renovations because if people are familiar with that address, it used to be, um, I think they used to manufacture light bulbs in that building. And um, it, a portion of the building is in uh, a residential, like not half, but less than half of that building is in residential because your block, that property is right at the tippy, at the end of the block, and it crosses over, well, then on the other side of that, you had another shelter that now turned back into a hotel. Um, so we've gone to the Department of, of, of Homeless Services. They tell us that they have no plans for this building. And it is infuriating to someone like myself. I have 20 plus years doing this as a city employee, not at the community board, but I've worked in the mayor's office, I've worked in the buildings department, and now I've been here for the last eight years. I know that when you look at the buildings department website, it says that the property owner is spending $1.2 million to renovate this building. No one, no savvy business, part, uh, business person is going to spend that kind of money unless they know that there's a contract at the end of that tunnel. And DHS, I'm saying that they're lying. We've spoken to our elected officials about this. I, I mean, it, it just hasn't gone anywhere. And it's disappointing. It really is. Um, but apparently this is what's happening all across the city. I shared with the community board an article that was in the New York Post the other day in regards to a shelter in Harlem that was supposed to, a building in Harlem, a luxury building that had a pool on the rooftop deck that was gonna be opened up for migrants. And then the mayor went to the tenant association meeting and boasted, oh, the migrants are not coming, but it's still a shelter. It's now gonna remain a shelter, but I guess for our people, regular people, I, I don't know, New Yorkers. Um, I don't think that that makes it any better. And I know that we have a housing crisis, and I know that we're trying to address this, but the, the lack of accountability and clarity from the Department of Homeless Services is very concerning. And the fact that no one, when we reach out to them, at, you know, is willing to take up our case. Again, back in 2019, I, I'm not gonna detail all the phone calls that were made, but it was literally two phone calls. I was, I was sitting down watching the Yankee game, and I got a phone call from an elected official. He was like, hey, is this really happening? I was like, yeah. He was like, I'll call the mayor. Called the mayor, the next day, it was gone. That's how it works, unfortunately. Now, again, we're in a different situation. I don't know if this is gonna be for our constituents, like regular New Yorkers, or if this is gonna be a migrant shelter. But. They, didn't see, they saw fit to move it back in 2019, and DHS again told us that they were not gonna move on this property, that they had no interest in this property. And again, you know, I can't tell, because again, DHS has said, we, we, we have no designs on this building. That is the email that they sent to me. And when you go to the building's website, who spends $1.2 million to convert it, not to a residential building, but to a not-for-profit with sleeping accommodations. And it's still in the process of getting, they have certain approvals, they don't have all of their approvals. Um, and just so that the people on that block know, one of your residents who lives on that block actually is a board member. She is not with us tonight. No, she is not with us, but she brought this to our attention, which is why we've been inquiring so much about it. So we're not gonna rest until we get a legitimate answer, but unfortunately I think the answer is going to be that it will be a shelter. When they're ready to open, we will receive a notification, you know, in 30 days or 60 days saying that it will open. And again, it's going to be a discredit to the agency because they've not shared with us that they were doing this or that's what their design was.
That's all I have to say. Um, Ma'am, I, I just wanted to add, as the housing chair, it is very... Testing, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to add that things are being done in more of a secretive way, more now than ever before. And this is not what you wanted to hear, but this is what you really need to hear. You know, I want to get upset at you because you came and I don't see 15 or 20 people, but I cannot blame you and I applaud you for bringing this information. But there's a lot going on and the squeaky wheel is the wheel that gets the grease. Those folks in Harlem, they raised Cain. They still raising hell over there. But yet and still, things are going forward. There's a difference. Shelters, migrants, this is a magnificent issue. It's affecting all of us, all right? And we really don't have an answer because no one is being direct with us and it's very upsetting, okay? We have a shelter that was just created across the street from a New York City Housing Authority development, all right? They're putting stuff up everywhere for just about anybody. So I, I fully understand um, I was there in 2019. I understand just what you're going through. I'm against this whole process, but yet and still, we have to remain united, and you're gonna have to bring more people. But that's not the reason why you're getting the answer you're getting, but the problem is not as direct as you would think. But as a community board, we will do the best that we can as a board to try to get through all of the circumstances that are blocking the main facts so that we can get to the core of the issue and explain directly. And at this point, we really can't do it. So I, I mean, I'm, and I'm very sorry for that, but that's where we at. We have different types of shelters. We have uh, DHS, we have, what's it, OEM? We have different types, the hotel, became a shelter. So I, I fully understand, and you know, we, we, we're reaching out to get answers, but we don't have any as of yet, so we're gonna keep trying. Well, well, people who feel the way you feel, all right? And I, I understand, you got neighbors and you got friends, they just probably couldn't make it tonight, and I, I understand. But if you're gonna make some noise, you're gonna really have to make some noise. And, and, and it's gonna be about that. Now that's not the reason why we're saying what we're saying to you. But I will tell you, all right, if you are going to contest an issue of this magnitude, you gotta have folks alongside of you, many, all right? And I'm not faulting you for that. I'm just gonna give you the issues that we've been presented with. And, but in the future, when people wanna sit here and complain, you better come in droves. And honestly, because that is what is gonna bring what we need. We need a combination of everything, including media attention. And that's basically it, all right? But I, I, I applaud you for bringing this issue here. Thank you. Thank you, we hope you're not discouraged. Keep coming and we're gonna be here to support it. We're, we're in the same fight. Uh, anyone else here in person that would like the floor for public gallery session? Okay, moving on to our virtuals, Virginia. I'm Virginia Sanders from the Wakefield Tax specifically. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak and my honor goes out to your board and all the good work they're trying to do. And as the young lady needs to know that we have several community organizations she needs to reach out to so we can join her in her fight. I mean, once we know about it, we can spread the word out and help her further. And uh, for your information, we are now coming to 
as of March to George Torres's office to have our meeting every third Thursday of the month. So this Thursday of the month in March, we hope to try to do some type of town hall meeting so we can bring together everybody that has problems so we can try to resolve everything that needs to be resolved. We're hoping that the political people will come. We're hoping that the churches will come, that we we'll all get together and try to help resolve our meetings and get together and find out what the problems are that we need in our community. We have to come together. We cannot do this to get alone. Only us, nobody lives here but us. So if we don't care about where we live, we have a problem. So please everybody, for Thursday, the third Thursday of March, let everybody know that Wakefield Taxpayers is having a town hall meeting. And I expect to send out flyers to everybody we could possibly do. We're going to try to do a big town hall meeting for the third Thursday for the Wakefield Taxpayers meeting. That's going to be a community board 12. Thank you for letting me speak and I hope to see everybody on the third Thursday of March. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Next up we have Patricia McDowell. Hello everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I just I want to also talk about the um, the possible shelter that's going to be built on Grace Avenue. Um, that community is basically uh, a senior community. Most of the residents that live there have been living there since 1969 and beyond. So it's very difficult for them to actually come to the community board meeting. However, we are actively researching um, that project. We are in the process of taking petitions around and getting them signed. It is our intent to bring those petitions to the board um, next month on the 9th of March. So we are active. It's because you don't see us there. We are very active in this process. And then I have a question. That project, when we um, did research, is zoned for um, construction. It's not, it's not a warehouse. It's not zoned for residential. Can anybody address that? Um, it's both. A portion of that building is in residential. Um, if I recall, it's, a, it's an M1 and R5. Um, like I said, less than 50% of that building. Um, I'm assuming it's the portion that's closest to the private houses that is um, in the, the residential. That is something that once the project is approved, can be challenged. But that's, once the project is approved on the building's website, then you can challenge the, um, the zoning. But that is one of the concerns. But I will say this as well. Sh hold, shelters have been built in, manufa in M1 districts. Um, there are hotels in M1 districts. And that, the thing is that this is not a hotel so there is there are questions surrounding the zoning on this because they're not building this as a transient use hotel they're building this as a not-for-profit with sleeping accommodations so you know that's my understanding of it but you know we can have that conversation uh, further offline but a portion of that building because I, I did look at it is is our I believe it's our five but I'll look while I'm one you know while I'm not talking I'll look at the, re at the zoning for it. Yeah, I don't remember it being um, an R5. It's, it's actually zoned as a, I have it written up, I can't remember. Oh, an e, a E9. When you go on the website for um, the taxes, um, it says that, that that property is an E9. I'm sorry? Yeah, e is not a um, zoning designation. Uh, it, there's only three types of zoning designations. There's commercial, residential, and manufacturing. I'm, like I said, I'll, I'll look it up. Um, oh, Luke's looking it up. Hold on. Okay. It's an M1 and an R5. Yeah, I was right. Yeah, thank you, Luke. It's M1. So, um, all right. I, can you see this? If, um, hold on. I'm going to put this on my, can you see the property here on the? Yes, I can see it. 
Okay. You guys. Uh huh. All right. So there's a black line that goes that cuts right through the. It's not this. It's off center. Right. Uh -huh. That smaller portion is the R5 portion of the property. The larger con. The larger part of the building is M11. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have pa Paolo. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, how are you? I was just going to piggyback on some of what the other people said. Um, basically, that was why I was here tonight. I was speaking to um, Council Member Riley's uh, representative, I can't recall her name right now, um, about Tilden Towers 2. I live in Tilden Towers 2, about some of the issues that we are facing, but then I took a minute to speak to her briefly about um, the shelter issue in the community. And I actually don't want to call these most of these shelters because they're actually scam shelters because they're, like you said before, they're kind of announcing that they're one thing, but they really know the whole time that they're, they have their intent to become shelters. So I spoke to her briefly about the one that's right next door to Tilden Towers too. Um, I think it's called the Bronxwood Shelter. Um, that was a project that got put in here. I looked on the website, they also had a 421A, I believe, tax break for that project as well. Um, again, that was one of those projects that claimed to be low-income housing, which was, we were already on a crowded block, but low-income housing sounds like, you know, everybody said, I, I mean, we'll do it, even though it's crowded, low-income housing sounds good. But before you know it, right when they get close to finishing the thing, all of a sudden there's bunk beds and um, blinds in there, and it's going to be a shelter. So now we have a few more projects. I think someone mentioned the one across from the public housing on Gun Hill and White Plains. I see two almost identical type of buildings going up on Gun Hill Road, one near Paulding and another one. And when I spoke to the representative, they said, you know, one of the main issues is community engagement and that these landlords have the right to do it. I guess she, she said it was called as of right. Um, they own the buildings and they have these rights. But again, then come out and say you're going to be a shelter from the beginning. Because when you look on the web, they say that they're going to be low income housing. They're getting tax breaks. The building next door had like a $4 million tax break. And what they do is they'll put some permanent, they'll, they'll maintain a couple units in there for permanent housing residents while they make the rest of it shelter. Um, and that makes it, I guess that helps them hold the agreement or whatever the case may be. But typically the residents who get the permanent housing are just um, shelter residents with vouchers from other shelters. Now, now they can live there and pay rent. Um, so the main issue was, he told me that we didn't have enough community engagement and that was the reason why a lot of these shelters are coming in. So that's what brought me here tonight. And then the first thing I hear about is shel the shelter issue, right? So again, there's no incentive for these landlords now to build low-income housing because they make more money on the shelters. They don't have to go out to any brokers. Literally, it's the same developers. If you look, you're going to recognize it's the same bricks, the same windows. Um, I believe it's stag development. I see uh, most of them. And again, if I don't hear anybody saying anything against it, as far as our politicians go, I would have to say that they're at least for it or neutral. But it looks like we have almost 30 people on here. I would imagine most of you are not in favor of, I would say, again, they're scam shelters. If you, if you come out and say you're a shelter, that's different, because then we can talk about that, right? But if you're going to say you're disguise yourself as low-income housing, which we need, and then turn yourself into a shelter, that's going to be make one landlord rich with all our taxpayer money, we're working against ourselves. We're paying one landlord. The city and the state don't even own these buildings. And then we're, and then we're losing the plots of land that we could develop into low-income housing. And then not to mention the other scam shelters that we see are the hotels, right? They're going up fast. They can't wait to finish. Why? Because the migrants are ready. Then as soon as they're done, they say, can you send up another bus? I'm ready to make my money. So that's why I'm here. I just wanted to add to some of the comments that I'm hearing from other, other people. Um, it's a big problem, and I do think we do need to brand the ones that don't declare themselves to be a shelter from day one as scam shelters, okay? That's all I have to say. Thank you for that. Um, we've all been talking about these new uh, developments that we're seeing. The one that you mentioned, the two new buildings between Paldi and Laconia, I've been saying they look like shelters or even prisons, the way they've been built. So those are definitely issues that we need to um, 
uh, be, you know, advocating for and talking about. So thank you. And I do want to mention that you should all also um, keep in mind that there are those like Paolo that want to be more involved and, and engage in the community. Applications to join community boards are open now, so we do encourage you. We do need more voices like yours, all of you that you've been joining us, to please um, fill out those applications and, and try and, and join our community board so that we can be stronger. Uh, next up, we have Karen. Hi, yes, um, I'm Karen Skinner, and it's so funny that he just said that more community involvement because I'm from Tilden 1. And last year, we discussed 829 Tilden Street because originally, when not 829, but the shelter that's in between Tilden and 829, when that building first came up, we were supposed to, um, let me see, the, the Seri Tilden, and Tilden 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 One, they were supposed to be a joint board. That never that never came to be, and um, we was we were talking about that building because all of a sudden it popped it popped up because it used to be a private sanitation company, and they um, they sold it, and and all of a sudden when eight twenty nine was finished being built, they threw that building up, and from the beginning. They said it was going to be a shelter from the very beginning because um, they invited us to come through, to walk through it. And then we had contacted Councilman Raleigh's office and he didn't even know anything about the meeting that was supposed to be taking place. And it was taking place at a community. It was last year sometime at one of these meetings here where he that he came up and he didn't know how many shelters that was supposed to be coming up in the building i mean coming up in our area and um he was supposed to get back with the information and um because we were complaining about how many shelters were in our community versus like say for instance Belton parkway and it, and and there's some some kind of law or legislation about your fair share it's like, you know, we have to, to, to house, uh, everybody agrees that the homeless has to be housed, but now you have the migrants and they're just throwing, we're, we're being overly indated and we have more than our fair share of what's going on in the city. Thank you, Karen. That's my comment. Yes. Um. Ma'am, I, I do remember that, and I do remember you coming. We had a housing committee meeting, and the issue was mainly circled around the fact that the folks who were doing the work, they started early in the morning, and we wanted to push back the time, and I do remember that. But it was brought right here to the community board, and we tried our best to deal with that, and you're right. Councilman Rowley was just getting started and he did not have those answers, all right? Since then, things have gotten magnificently horrifying, all right, with regards to this word shelter. The first avenue that you see is you're gonna see housing and they call it affordable housing. And then they want you to have an income of about 75 to $85,000 and you'll see it. It's on the paperwork. No one can afford that on a low income basis. So when they got no perspectives, that's when they change up. And that's when the word shelter comes into play. Now this happens. This happens, this is how they start. The question then becomes what type of shelter? But this is what's going on, it's going on everywhere and we're trying our best to stay on top of it, but it's very difficult. So we need folks to come out. If you want to have a, a, a meeting every third Thursday here, a town hall meeting, that's fine, because people can network. There's always strength in numbers. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. However, you need to know that this community board is doing the best it could do under the circumstances we're being dealt with. We hold meetings and folks, they don't come. They don't, it's in a representative, okay? 
we can't get to the crux of some of the issues that way. So these are the problems that exist, and I'm not trying to circle the wagons. I'm not going to BS you, but this is what's going on. There's no direct transparency, and we're, we're fighting to ascertain that. So just be mindful. But I understand the plight. It is, it's affecting and infecting all of us. But we have to stay unified, and unification starts right here, right now. Because you're going to have people who are going to show up and meet other people, and collectively, that's when the difference could be made. So we're going to do our part as a community. So thank you. Thank you all. That concludes our um, public gallery session. We will close that out. And now we're going to move on to a um, presentation by the Office of Cannabis Management. Are they here? Yes, we're good here. evening. We're here. Um, good evening, uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, and George, good to see you. We're always emailing back and forth and he calls, so he definitely is always working hard for, you know, your board. So we're gonna do a quick slideshow, it's about 10 minutes, and then we will open up for Q&A. So my colleague Phil Rumsey will do the slideshow. Perfect. Thank you, Pascal. Good evening, everyone. My name is Phil Rumsey. I'm the manager of the of Intergovernmental Outreach here at the Office of Cannabis Management. And um, yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen and um, walk you through the PowerPoint. Okay, everyone can see that all right? Yeah, you're good, Phil. I want to start off with some uh, key licenses and uh, dates. It was uh, September of last year when the Cannabis Control Board approved the adult use uh, regulations. We had a few important um, dates here. Um, the application for the licensing began October 4th. If an individual had proof of control over the um, uh, retail location, they had to apply by November 17th. And if individuals are just uh, applying without proof of control, they had until December 18th to apply. The license type during this application window, excuse me, the, yeah, the different license types, one was the cultivator license, the other was a processor license. We had the micro business, um, a distributor, and a retail dispensary. And you can see we have different uh, target goals for each different license type. I want to discuss the role of community boards in the application process. So per the cannabis law, community boards, along with municipalities across the state, have the opportunity to express an opinion on whether they support the Cannabis Control Board's approval of three different license types. And each of these license types do have the capability of selling uh, directly to individuals. So the first one is the retail dispensary, and I think everyone is familiar with that. Uh, the second one is the micro business. This is the more uh, a fully inter mo almost fully integrated license type where it allows them to participate in um, many of the licenses that I laid out there. And um, it's one of the broader license types. So when a micro business is going to be uh, selling, it does have to go through this process as well. And the last is an article for registered organizations. Those are the much larger entities. They can be fully integrated, whereas a micro business, you are capped at what you can grow and uh, sell. So the opinion of the community board will become part of the record when the Cannabis Control Board decides whether or not to grant or deny an application. 
Uh, community boards don't have a role in the approval or denial of other license types. So if a nursery or a processor or a distributor is coming in, um, community boards and municipalities don't have the ability to weigh in on those. We wanted to make sure that that was held for license types, again, that were selling to uh, the, the public in general. So there is a specific form that an individual must send to the community board. Um, that is the notification to municipalities form. I do want to say now that we will be sending this PowerPoint out to the community board um, and they can distribute this. We do have the link here at the top. Um, so you can take a look at the form itself if you would like to. The notification form must be sent by certified mail, overnight delivery service, or a personal service. And we're doing that to make sure um, um, that the notification gets to the community board. Once the notification is received, the community board will have 30 days to reply to the Office of Cannabis Management with their advisory opinion. There can be a 30-day extension. If the request for the additional 30 days is made within the original 30-day time period. So again, when you receive the letter, you can date stamp it. That kicks off um, 30 days to reply to the office or within that 30 days, you can request an extension. If you email municipalities at ocm.ny.gov, you will receive that additional 30 days extension. So with the extension, you would have a, a total of 60 days to review the um, um, uh, the notification to municipalities form. So OCM enforcement activities, this has certainly been a huge issue for us and certainly um, um, drives a lot of the discussions that we have. And I wanna walk everyone through <clears throat> where we started and where we are going with our enforcement activities. When we first started out, when the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act was signed into law March 31st of 2021, the Office of Cannabis Management had no jurisdiction over an entity that was not licensed by us. So if the Office of Cannabis Management didn't hand someone a license and say, you can open up a business, we had no jurisdiction over them. So when the illicit shops started to pop up, we had no ability, no legal ability to go in, stop them, find them, or confiscate anything. We had the same power as the Department of Transportation has over these stores. We, we didn't have any authority. So during that time period, our enforcement division started reaching out, working with local DAs and law enforcement, coming up with strategies, um, uh, creating multi-agency task force to try to um, come up with additional avenues to try to shut down the stores. And um, we're, con we're continuing to build up the um, um, outreach efforts. So after we um, started off there, um, there were revisions to the cannabis law and tax law that were included in the 2023-2024 budget. And that created a much stronger regulatory framework for us to use. It allowed OCM to take enforcement actions against businesses selling cannabis without the required license, and they're often referred to as sticker shops. Uh, it allowed OCM to conduct regulatory inspections of all businesses selling and giving away cannabis. And it, it did allow us to pursue a court order if we needed to, if a illicit shop was not allowing us to inspect these. It did grant OCM the ability to seize cannabis found at these businesses and to assess a variety of different civil penalties against the unlicensed shops. This included the New York 
State Department of Tax and Finance and the Office of Cannabis Management. So additionally, we were, um, we are able to revoke, suspend, um, and cancel any of the license or permits under the um, cannabis law for anyone who does have a license from us who has been found to be engaging in any kind of illicit um, um, selling or behavior. We do have the authority to conduct the regulatory inspections, including vehicles. And if an entity is claiming to sell medical cannabis, adult use cannabis, cannabis products, cannabinoid hemp, hemp extract, we do have the ability to go into that business and assume what they are advertising, what they are talking about is actually what they are doing. Um, so any products that are labeled that way um, or trying to be sold um, um, with any of those labeling or, or any of those claims, um, we now have uh, jurisdiction and the ability to move forward with um, um, trying to shut down the stores. Uh, additionally, any legal dispensary will have this sticker. It's about a 12 inch tall sticker. It's on the outside of their store. They do, all legal dispensaries do have to display this and um, you can walk up, use your phone, scan the QR code and it will verify that it is a legal dispensary. Medical dispensaries also have to have this. Uh, I do want to flag another distinction here between legal and illicit shops you cannot see inside of a legal shop you shouldn't be able to see any product whatsoever um and they shouldn't have any neon signs out front either so right off the bat it, it would be pretty obvious which stores are illegal and which stores are le legal uh, governor hokel has proposed um, some actions that would strengthen our enforcement authority. These are proposals right now. This is not law. These are things that are going to be worked on during this legislative session. Um, some of the proposals include the ex um, expedited closure of the illicit businesses. Um, it would um, expand the powers of the Office of Cannabis Management to streamline padlocking of the illicit shop. Right now we do have to go through many uh, um, filters in order to um, um, padlock a shop. It authorizes local governments to execute OCM padlock orders to ensure faster and more efficient um, closures of dispensaries. And it does establish local registries of licensed cannabis shops and illicit cannabis shops that would help local governments and New York City to move forward and identify these places and shut them down. So that was the overview of what we've been up to. And um, if you would like to sign up for some OCM email updates, you can go to our website, cannabis.ny.gov. Uh, if you scroll down just a little bit on the main site, uh, you'll see where you can sign up with your emails and you will receive um, press releases, notification of um, cannabis control board activities and other things. And for additional questions, you can uh, reach out to the municipalities at ocm.ny.gov. That's the same email that um, um, you would be sending the advisory opinions to as well. So with that, I will... Uh, stop the presentation here. Thank you, Philip. Does anyone have any questions? Any of our board members? Okay, if you could just share that presentation with us, that would be great. Thank you so much for coming to the board. Ms. Benitez, do you have any questions? So far, have you all um seen any illegal shops here and have you all taken actions in this district in reference to this? Um, 
so it's hard to give you a clear answer to that just simply because we um our enforcement agents are active across the state and we try not to provide too much information about where they go because we don't want anybody to you know try to figure out a pattern of how we do our enforcements and things like that but we are active across the state we have been active in the bronx would you say that your team is a very small team and that's why because you're talking about across the state is that one of the reasons why you may not be able to get to uh, different sites within the city of New York? So we are a growing team. Additionally, we work in an intra-agency fashion. So we work with the um, New York City Sheriff's Department, um, with DOHMH, with Worker Protection. We also work with uh, sister agencies of the state, um, you know, Department of Tax. So when you work in an intra-agency fashion, you know, you, you have more resources and you have more ability and more, more bandwidth. Thank you. Robert? Yes, just quickly, uh, what's the anticipated time frame uh, uh, from an application for a shop to the approval or denial uh, of a license? Um, I, I can't really say that there is a a standard uh a standard time um so we had two paths for adult use applicants and so one was people who brought their own location and so they either owned the building or already had a lease and then there were people who were provisional and the people who brought their own location their application deadline was November 17th. And then for the provisional, it was December 18th. And we just issued some licenses last Friday. It is a very labor intensive process. We have to make sure that um, the proximity, per, um, you know, the proximity rules are met. 200 feet from a house of worship, 500 feet from a school has to be exclusively used as such um a thousand foot from another dispensary uh so we have to do the all those verifications additionally sometimes people they miss things in their application so we have to cure the application we have to give them time so we email some people are super eager and they get back to us immediately and other people are you know like the tortoise they take a little bit more time so i understand all of those things are factors so it, it wouldn't be unusual if it was a year-long process, just my only question. I mean, it, I wouldn't say that it would be a year-long process, um, but it would certainly not be something that, you know, would happen within two to three weeks. Oh, okay, thank you. You know, you kind of avoided the question with enforcement. I mean, you didn't give us any numbers as to how many enforcement officers you have. Um, and this thing doesn't work without proper enforcement. I mean, secondly, I mean, is it just the, um, the, the person who run the store is going to be fine? What, is, what, is, what, is, what about the landlord? Do they take any responsibility for anything that takes place in your problem, is on your property? And now do we make them accountable so that you can actually, you know, make this thing work the way it should work. I mean, we decided that we're going to legalize um, marijuana. We decided that, that we're going to give a license to people. And then we're saying that the enforcement is going to be somewhat spotty in terms of the illegal shops. And that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. And I don't hear any numbers. I don't hear the numbers of saying that, look, we have 200 enforcement officers across, talking about the state of New York, that's a, a big area to cover by how many people, you know? And like I said, people will follow the rules when it hurts, it hurts their pocketbook. How do we make sure that these illegal shops don't, does not work? Do we just hit the, the, um, the person who is the, um, the proprietor or do we hit the landlord to make sure that they feel the pain too? I mean, what are we doing here? 
Um, so we also go after the landlord, but it first starts with um, a cease and desist letter. And so that is how the process, the, the investigation begins. We get a complaint through our website um, and then our enforcement officers go in. Um, again, a lot of times it's in an, it's in an interagency fashion and um, you know they check the premises and if there is illicit cannabis, they will immediately issue a cease and desist letter and you know that kicks off the investigation. It also allows the landlord to be liable. We're working with the DAs. They are also part of this interagency task force. And so they also um, have you know, tools at their disposal to go after landlords. Um, so it is all of those things. So we go after the people who are selling, we go after the owner, we go after the landlords, and we're working as aggressively as we can. We also continue to hire in our enforcement um, team. That is the fastest growing team at the office. I don't have a number off top of mind. Um, to, to provide you, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, that doesn't make you happy, uh, but we can look for the number and we can send it to George when we get it. Um, I, I will add that um, I can send along an additional uh, PowerPoint, which does go into more detail on the different types of fines that can be levied and um, 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 some more granular level detail on uh, the process at play here. It is rather complicated. Uh, people are, you know, there is a presumption of innocence. We do have to move um, somewhat slowly as a, a case is built. But I will send an additional PowerPoint. And, um, you know, if you could distribute that to the individual um, asking for a little bit more information here, it does. Uh, it does a deeper dive into the uh, powers that we have. Thank you. Anthony? Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for that, uh, that statement that you made, gentlemen, before me, and, and thank you for the uh, response. Uh, I, I'd just like to thank you guys for the information that you're sharing. It, it, it's very helpful. Uh, one of my questions is, is when you guys do get a cease letter or, or you do get a complaint, is the community board in that area or the town hall in that area notified that you have that complaint or that cease order? Um, we, we don't notify the local board or the local municipality about the cease and desist letter um, simply because we are doing the investigation and so we don't want to jeopardize the investigation. Even those of us who work on OCM, Phil, Adam, who is also part of our team and I, we don't know where the, the um, investigators are, when they're, what portion of the investigation they're in. Like, um, wow. I'm sorry, there's a lot of screens going on and I've tried to um, change my layout and it's still a lot. Um, so we don't know where they are in the investigation um, because there they're literally is a firewall and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they don't want to jeopardize it and they don't want information to inadvertently get out um, and so you know we don't we don't necessarily contact municipalities um, to let them know we don't contact community boards to let them know, hey, we're investigating, making up this address, 353 West 145th Street. At, excuse me, thank you for that. At what point do you notify the uh, community or the town hall about the situation? So we have a... a um, a newsletter that goes out and it gives um, broad information about everything. As Phil said, there's a presumption of innocence. And so, um, 
you know, in the newsletter, it gives, a, a, you know, broad strokes about what our enforcement tax, where we've enforced. So it will say, you know, what areas of the state. It won't give granular information. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have one more. George. Sorry, thank you, Pasquale, for, uh, for being here. Um, I, real quick question, we're getting requests uh, to, on the chat to share the PowerPoint presentation. I have this PowerPoint that was sent to, that we sent, that we shared with community board members a long time ago. Is that something that we could share with the people requesting it? Yeah, as Phil said, we're going to send you the PowerPoint oh, okay. um, from tonight, and he's also going to include the PowerPoint, um, our enforcement PowerPoint. Okay, so thank you. Get you. Both. Mm -hmm. And a, a shameless plug for everybody who's in the virtual world and, and TV land, uh, sign up at our website for our mailing list, and you will get all of our emails, including this PowerPoint. Um, I'm not going to send it individually to everybody. So we, we send in, we'll share it with everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I stepped away for a second. I did have a question because um, what prompted the request to have you come before the board was that at our last full board meeting last month, we had two applicants that had applied um, not so far away from one another. One was on uh, White Plains Road and the other one was on 241st Street. Yeah, both ends. And um, I just, uh, in, in terms of fair share, and, and the, I know that this is not a, a state policy, but it's a citywide policy, um, what should we expect as a community board? Is it going to be, are you guys going to be policing the number of applications that we receive or, and, and potentially licenses that are awarded? Um, so for example, can I see upwards of, right now we have two, uh, we approve both of them. Um, or we voted in favor of both of them. Uh, one, I think, is right at the cusp of getting the license. They're in this next round of whenever you're going to approve it. Um, but I guess my fear was, I was like, oh, there are a lot of other community boards, especially in the Bronx, that don't have any approved, and here we have two already that are approved for our community board. Is that something that you guys, is OCM going to be policing so that we don't get inundated with so many smoke shops or uh, cannabis shops? Yeah, Pascal, I can actually take this one. Okay. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Stoneski, Program Specialist with the OCM and Phil and Pascal. Um, so as we talked before, there are distance requirements per each dispensary in NYC that is a thousand for proximity. So no dispensary can be within that parameters. Um, under the assumption that these two locations you said you had approved, um, obviously that came with an advisory opinion. So that will be weighed at the time their application is actually in front of the Cannabis Control Board. It is part of the official record that we weigh our opinion. Um, if any of those dispensaries are within those two are AU and they're within a thousand feet, whichever application is going to the board first, and if they are approved, they will have that priority and they will be awarded that 1,000 foot proximity protection. Um, so, with any of those, again, the, weighing the advisory opinion as well, um, you know, if there are within a thousand feet, there's a chance that only one or even none of those dispensaries will be located there. So there is no limit, it's only the 1,000 foot proximity. Correct. But there's also a limit on the actual amount of licenses awarded in this queue um, that is split between NYC and the rest of the state. So it's uncertain on what community board specifically will have some dispensaries in this queue. Uh, it really depends on what locations were brought to OCM um, by the applicant. Um, but yeah, we continue to review locations uh, and all the critical other criteria regarding you know true party of interest their application details all the entity information okay i'm sorry and my final question in regards to something my board member raised in regards to penalties um after your investigation is over is there going to be a sort of a portal similar to like the buildings department or any other city agency that notifies people of violations that were issued or anything like that i understand that once the once it's being investigated, there's nothing, but after the fact, like judgments, did they pay a fine? Was there a sort of judgment? Um, is there gonna be a process where we can see that? Um, we'll have to source that answer and get back to you um, okay. about that. Because right. we're still, as you know, um, OCM is 
three years old. So we're still developing all of our systems and infrastructure. Uh, so we just don't, it could very well be that there's a plan to do that. Um, but we just have to source the answer and get back to you. If there is not a plan to do that, we certainly will make that recommendation on behalf of your board. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you to your team for uh, being here with us this evening. One more question. Yes. Um, is the sales of the, um, the cannabis a taxable sale? And how are you going to enforce collecting the taxes on the cannabis? Because what we're trying to do here in Community Board 12 is our main corridor, commercial corridor, we want taxable income bases on, on White Plains Road. All we have on White Plains Road right now is a lot of um, beauty, so beauty shops and barber shops and all that stuff. And a lot of it is cash and carry. So how, how could we collect or get taxable sales from this cannabis? That's gonna so be there is a 4% uh, <clears throat> uh, excise, uh, excise sales tax that's involved at the uh, retail level. Um, or excuse me, I'm sorry, we, we collect a 4%, um, 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 which is distributed to the municipality where the dispensary is located. However, I do want to be clear in, in the, for New York City, it will be going to the New York City coffers. It won't necessarily be distributed to, um, you know, at, at a community board level, uh, if that makes sense. And um, we also have some, um, sales tax that will be set aside for the Cannabis Advisory Board. And that's different from the Cannabis Control Board, which I mentioned earlier. Cannabis Control Board are, are the ones that um, approve the license types and a lot, a lot of the regulatory issues at play. Um, the Cannabis Advisory Board, they do, they, they are developing a way for uh, nonprofits and entities at a more granular local level to apply for different grants that will be available in the future. So, you know, we're, we're, we definitely have systems in place to make sure all legal sales are captured when they're happening in a legal dispensary. And it's another uh, huge issue with the illicit shops where they are taking money out of the community directly. Um, so, you know, we could actually send a little bit more additional information on the Cannabis Advisory Board and what they've been up to and how they're trying to structure these grants that uh, a more localized entity would be able to apply for. Um, but otherwise, I mean, it, it, as far as the, the literal tax collection happening during retail sales, that's very much built in. We're going to uh, ensure that every legal dispensary has that capability before they can open. So it, it won't be a problem as far as um, actually, you know, collecting that tax as the sales are occurring in a legal dispensary. That's um, very much baked in. They have to have specific systems capable of doing that before they can open. And the MRTA, um, it's written in there, the, the um, you know, the cannabis fund that Phil was talking about, and it, it really is to go to uh, communities disproportionately impacted by prohibition. So I live in Harlem. I know where your community board is. Like there are parts of your community board that were disproportionately impacted by prohibition. Um, and so that is going to be, as we open up more stores um, and there are more sales, uh, there are legal sales that are taxed, um, there'll be more monies in the fund to be distributed. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna conclude this part. Thank you so much for coming and for the information you've shared. We look forward to continuing to learn more as, as um, this continues to expand. This concludes this part of the agenda. We're going to now move on to elected official reports. Uh, we'll start with um, Cynthia.
Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, as you may know, my name is Cynthia from Councilmember Riley's office. Just to go over the usual, phone number is 718-684-5509. Email is district12 at council.nyc.gov. We have two offices in uh, the district, one at 135 Einstein Loop in Co-op City and the other at 940 East Gun Hill Road in the Bronx. For our legislative update, I originally planned one, but I'm going to mention a second one if that's fine. <laughs> so for the first legislative update that I wanted to mention is uh, introduction 1131 was sex successfully passed by the New York City Council in December and is now in effect as local law 32 of 2024 as of the end of January. This law, um, it actually uh, transitions the enforcement of unlicensed mobile car washes car washes from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, which had it been under previously, to the Department of Sanitation, which has a broader enforcement ability and a lot more of the infrastructure to actually deal with the tangible items uh, brought on by mobile car washes. Uh, both agencies are kind of working in this transition, and so uh, the goal is by the summer to be able to have that more fluidly passed on for DSNY to be able to take this up. We do continue to ask New Yorkers to report to 301. Please, please, please put in that 301 report. Data always helps. <laughs> and so uh, actually on my second legislative update, because it came up kind of throughout this, I believe it was um, you had mentioned about the landlords and in terms of cannabis. So there was actually a local law passed by the city council last year that does have uh, rulemaking about landlords not knowingly leasing, not just to illicit cannabis shops, but also illicit tobacco shops. So that is a local law, that is one that is in effect. Uh, the council member did support it when it came to the full council. So there are these avenues being brought, not just on the state level, but on the city level too. <laughs> Switching over real quick to events, um, did want to invite everyone to our uh, February community conversation with this month's topic being sanitation. That's going to be next Tuesday, February 27th at 6.30 p.m. at Bronx Bethany Church of the Nazarene at 971 East 227th Street. Doors open at 6 p.m. Also want to let the community know about our two homeowners property tax information sessions. One will be at Bay Eden Older Adult Center, 1220 East 229th Street. That one is on February 28th, 2 to 4 p.m. That one's in the daytime. If you can't make that one, we're going to have another one on Friday, March 1st, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Northeast Bronx YMCA, 1250 East 229th Street. If you have any questions about those events, uh, want to let us know that you're coming, you can email d12events at council.nyc.gov or call us at 718-684-5509. There are going to be flyers. <laughs> Did also want to remind everyone about uh, tax season. Eligible New Yorkers can file their taxes for free in the city. Um, throughout New York City, you can contact nyc.gov slash tax prep, but District 12 residents can also get their taxes done for free as long as they're eligible at either one of our district offices. And you can do that one at 718-684-5509 or bit.ly slash Riley Free Tax Prep 24. First letter of each is capitalized. And again, flyers will be at the door. <laughs> Any questions? No? Okay. <laughs> Anytime. You have a question? No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, anyone else? Ronell? Hi, my name is Ronell from State Center Jamal T. Bailey's office. Our office is located at 959 East 233rd Street between Eden Wall and Gunther Avenue. So yesterday we had our Black History celebration at the YMCA. That was a major su success. Um, we got to showcase artwork from our students within the district as well as our senior citizens. Um, also, we have our monthly food distribution. So if you know anyone that's in need of food, that is Wednesday, February 28th for, um, at 2 p.m. at our office, 959 East 233rd Street. It's a first come, first serve basis. So please share that information for those in need. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're moving to our virtual um, elected representatives that are here. Is there anyone that would like to speak? I can go if you guys are ready for me. This is Sadiq. 
Uh, Kiara, we can't hear you. Kiara. Uh, that was Frederice speaking. I can go after her. Okay. Frederice, then you first. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, also, thank you, Kiara. Um, so, I'm Frederice. I've been a few times in person, unfortunately, even though CB12 is my favorite community board meeting to attend. I wasn't able to go today, um, but I'll be at the next one for sure. I just wanted to bring you some brief updates. So first would be the legislative update, which is very fun. Um, we were able to have some official documentation from the office today. Uh, so the office just passed a bill that makes it easier for qualified seniors living in city-run Mitchell Lama housing to apply for SCRE. A lot of people know what SCRE is, but for those who don't, it stands for Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption. So that means that you get some money off of your rent which is a great thing because as we know, times are tough. And if you are applicable um, for the exemption, we'd love to have you in the office to show you how to fill it out. We also can send you this great application. Um, and then one thing that makes it great is, and particularly to the legislative update, is that a pre-filled screen application will be sent to you. So starting next year, if the information on your income affidavit indicates that you qualify for screen, so if it shows that you are supposed to get screen, you're gonna get a pre-filled application to you. So it makes it easier. Um, I think that that's a really great thing for many people since many people don't even know that they're eligible. So if you have concerns or you have questions, please feel free to reach out to the office. You can give a call to me at 718 uh, 549 7300. You can also reach out to the D11 at council.nyc.gov email. You can also email me directly. I have dropped it in the chat, all my information, but you can feel free to go ahead and send me one. It's F Latchman, like my last name, at council.nyc.gov. Um, we also were doing some library office hours. We're at the Wakefield Library uh, once a month. It's the last Thursday of the month, so you can stop by. Um, usually it's myself, Julio, or Crystal. We may even have stuff um, there as well, so feel free to speak to any of us. Just ask us when you get to the library. We're happy to see you. And my second to last update, so Wakefield Triangle is located at the cross of East 241st Street in Cranford and White Plains. So the office funded the Horticultural Society of New York, also known as the Hort, to beautify it, which is wonderful. Um, and they've been on site doing some planting and making the space a little bit more beautiful and aesthetically pleasing for the community. Last update for everyone is the ACE route. So just to give a brief reminder, our cleanup crew ACE um, is on White Plains Road from East 233rd, so East 233 to East 243 daily, Monday through Friday. And now they're gonna be in Woodlawn 2 um, on Katona between 235 or 235th and 240. And that's it for me. Wanted to keep this short and brief. If Thank you have you. any questions, let us know. Thank you. Put your information in the chat. Uh, next up, Kira. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, Kira Gannon from the Borough President's Office. I just, I'm going to be really brief. Um, our community board application is live um, for new applicants, but I've also reached out to board members who are up for renewal this year. Our application is electronic only. Um, so please make sure you um, check out the link that I've sent. I've just put it in the chat. The deadline is March 1st. Um, so I ask that all of you apply before then um, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or issues with the application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other elected official representatives that are on with us virtually? Okay, well that concludes that portion of our um, uh, reporting. I think we're, we're going to do roll call now. For those who are on virtual, please um, open your screens so that I can see you before I begin. If you're a board member, I'd like to see your face. Judith Benitez, present. Carla Bosati. Present. Patricia Boswell. Present. Michelle Armstrong. Present. Victor Brown. 
Victor Brown, Victor Brown, Victor Brown, <coughs> Deacon Brown, Desiree Campbell, Desiree Campbell, absent, Sadie Campbell, here. Are you on screen, Ms. Campbell? Jean. Yes, um, okay. yes. Thank you. Joan Claude? On screen, yay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Beatrice Coronel? Here. Antonia Davis? Right here. Chris Devone? Chris Devone? Absent. Tolene Dickerson? On screen, present. Thank you. Denise Echeverria? Absent. Alfredo Figueroa is excused. Katrina Fuentes? Katrina? Absent. Johnny Goff is excused. Darren Grant? Absent. Sheila Grierson. Right here. Thank you. Sandra Gross. Absent. Robert Hall. Here. Carrie Ann Henry. Absent. John Isaac. James Theodore. Virtual present. Thank you. Uh, Keisha Martin. Absent. Robert Link. Present. Got you. Javi Malik. Absent. Uh, Mark. No. Absent. Lucia Martin. Absent. Antoinette Mitchell. Absent. <laughs> Am I hearing Antoinette Mitchell? Okay. Clinton Mike. Present. Carmen Ortiz. I saw her. She's here. Yeah, on, I saw her okay. She, I think she's still here. Okay. Wayne Palmer. Reginald Paris. Ariel Peters is excused. Anthony Reed. He was on camera before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Sherry Samuels. Carl Stricker. Yeah. Benga Sevea. Yeah. Luke Sabados. Yeah. Deborah Torado excused. Damon Tortin. I don't see him. Uh, absent. Deborah Walker. Present. Is she online? Yeah, she's on camera. On yeah. camera? Thank you. And Ryan Walters. Okay. Absent. We still don't have a form. Berman is raising her hand. Who's this? Berman Ortiz is raising her hand. Oh. Anthony Reed, uh, present. We got you, Tony. I mean, we got you, Carmen. Okay. Thank you. All right, just so is that everybody Anthony knows. Reed? Did you get Anthony Reed? I got you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a quorum. You know, we say this frequently every meeting. It is important that you all attend in person. And so as a result, now we are not able to pretty much vote. And we're going to have to end our meeting and table a lot of the business that we had on our agenda for next. Um, my report, I, I emailed it. Everybody should have it. Please review it. If you have any questions, you can email me. George? Yeah. Uh, same here. Um, the, the report I emailed. The only thing I wanted to say, because I didn't get to say it last <clears throat> month, was I wanted to thank the New Face team, which are the people who produce our um, show, because they got all the TVs to work. So last month we had all the TVs working, um, and that's been the dream. Um, they don't 
all work simultaneously. Um, and actually, I have a good mind to flip the table around now so that we face all of the TVs rather than just the one. Um, but thank you guys. Oh, and uh, if you guys remember the training that we did for what is zoning, um, it is a long two hour video, but it's gonna be up on our YouTube channel soon um, for any board member who wants to see it and see, um, get the training session that we did here in the building. So it's, uh, we're just putting final edits on it and it'll be up on the video soon, on the uh, YouTube channel soon. Thank you. Um, we, we'll, Talene, we'll, do you we'll, have we'll, anything for the financial report? Sorry. I'm sorry, somebody else is speaking at the same time? Uh, I didn't see a raised yes, hand. Yes, I, just, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to know if we were going to get certifications for that. Yes. A certificate or something. Yes, that's uh, coming shortly. All right, thank you so much. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, Talene? No problem, Anthony. Um, it's always good to hear and see everybody. Uh, the Sunshine Fund has, is currently $2,660. If you have any questions, I put my information in the chat. Thank you. Well, everything else, like I said, we're going to have to table it until next month. Um, can I get a motion to close? Uh, yes. uh, Beatrice, can I just say one thing? Um, sure. Go ahead, Carl. And yeah, I, just, I just want to invite everybody to the land use committee meeting on March 12th. We will be discussing Wakefield Village. If you want to know what's happening with Wakefield Village, please attend that meeting on March 12th at 7 o'clock. March, March land use um, committee meeting, March 12th, <laughs> super important, 7 p.m. Luke, thank you, Carl. Oh, it's March 11th. Monday, March 11th, land use meeting. I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, as we saw at our last full board meeting, the Bronx Park East Farmers Market is uh, planning to expand to Gun Hill Road and White Plains Road. Right now, um, they are accepting vendor applications. Uh, so if anybody is, uh, knows a family member who um, uh, is a vendor of uh, produce, uh, meat, seafood, poultry, uh, eggs, florists, dairy products, bread or baked goods, condiments, uh, juices, plants and seedlings that, that bear fruit, uh, you should apply. Um, it's great for um, family members who might uh, have a knack for uh, this kind of thing. Uh, the website to apply is U as in umbrella, B as in Bronx, healthyproject.org slash apply. So that's U B healthyproject.org slash apply. Um, also, just wanted to mention that uh, this season, uh, the New York Restoration Project is giving away free trees, including plum trees. Uh, persimmon trees and a lot of other great fruit trees uh, that you can have in your backyard. That's the New York Restoration Project. Uh, Bissell Gardens and others will be hosting tree giveaways. Thanks. Thank you, Luke. Uh, do any uh, of... No dates yet, but um, it's coming this spring. I think April, April 12th or something is going to start, so... Okay, uh, another announcement, reminders, reappointments. Um, our board members that need to reapply, the deadline is March 1st. Michelle Bloomfield, we already spoke. Carla Brasati, um, Victor Brown, Johnny Golf, um, Theodore James, Keisha Martin, Anthony Reed, Carl Stricker, Deborah Tirado, Mark Uruwek Wong, Mark Luke. And Deacon Edward Brown, reminder, please, to fill out your um, applications. Yes, uh, announcement, new business, bylaws, 
proposed change from a 10-day meeting notice to a seven-day notice. So we'll be bringing up that matter coming up. Okay, so I'm within. Right, so the process for amending the bylaws is that the proposed change is announced in one meeting and then in the subsequent meeting it's voted on. So there's no action we need to take tonight. Can I get a motion to end? Motion, motion. So moved. Okay, and so we're wrapping up our meeting at 832. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Great meeting. Good night.